Hello YouTube. Um, I wanted to do a video today about a mosaic. A mosaic of uh, two columns in one row. That means two images side by side captured to obtain a larger field of view. In this case, it is of the center of the heart nebula. Uh, this is um, an image I took last year when I was still struggling with some kind of weird artifacts due to um, a secondary baffle that was installed for different purposes. So the reason I did a mosaic and the reason you do a mosaic is because the object that you're trying to image doesn't fit in your field of view and you want to present a different point of view than what you would capture in a single frame. Usually you the minimum mosaic would be two by one or one by two depending on how you look at it. Um, I've done two by two mosaics as well. It's a lot harder um, with every single square, you're multiplying the data once more. So if you have four hours for one single tile, tile you'll have 16 for four um, and eight for two and so forth. And you can also do one by threes and other types of mosaics. Usually I tend to do uh, two by one and that's just because that's usually what I want to capture. Um, I have tried two by two. It is a monumental project because it takes a long time and usually I like to capture at least 20, 30 hours of an object. Um, this object here, it is around uh, almost 70 hours, I think, about uh, 35, 40 per, chan uh, per uh, single um, tile. So the left tile has less, the right tile, tile has more, the left tile just had a little bit more of the dust nebulosity I wanted to see and the right tile had uh, the Milat 15 nebula and everything I was looking for. Now, in today's video we're going to look at the equipment, we're going to look at what the left and right tile look like, how I merged the two tiles together, how I kind of process the information, and what are my final results. I'm actually really happy with this image and um, I think it turned out really well. I haven't printed it like I did the one behind me of the North American Nebula, but in the foreseeable future, I think I'm going to print it on a large mosaic, probably somewhere around the range of, I would want to say 40 by 60 would be the format that I would print it up uh, in. Now, um, if you haven't seen my channel so far, the telescope I used, I actually have it next to me in a couple of videos, the one about the Lagoon Nebula and the one about the Orion Nebula. It is the Officina Stellari CRC 312. Let's go to it and let's take a look. So this is uh, some photos uh, that my wife took recently when I was trying to share with um, a media organization the equipment I was using. So this is exactly the equipment I used to take these images, the Officina Stellari CRC 320, uh, the QH5 600 Pro, as you can see it from the side, QH5 filter wheel, ZWO, OAG and the 174 Mini, the Asado 3 inch, and this is the hub. Uh, you can see it here and here. This controls the temperature regulation on the mirrors and also the fans. Um, the Asado 3 inch, like I said, the Paramount ME1, which is a fantastic mount. I had it for almost three years now. Never had a problem with it. I upgraded. I upgraded it to the MKS 5000, which has uh, a better tracking mode. Uh, it takes less T points to get a better tracking um, algorithm, and it's got better connectivity than the older one. Um, yeah, Software Biscay makes some of the best mounts in the world uh, by by far. It has connectivity at the back, as you can see. I have power coming from here, 12 volts and 5 volts. Um, it has USB 2.0 because it's a bit older, so it doesn't. Really, I don't really use that. I only use the auxiliary power that comes with it. Um, now I have my computer. This is a Amazon bought King Dell mini PC, you can use an Intel NUC, you can use an AMD, it doesn't matter as long as it at least has a quad core and 16 gigs of RAM, you're good, it will work really well. This is almost like a dedicated remote setup, it's that easy to use, I turn it on, the mount is parked, I home it, it doesn't have uh, encoders, so that's why I have to home it, and then I get to image. So, very good setup. Uh, this mount is miles better than even the newer Ioptron 120 EC2, which is supposed to be the, one of the best mounts. It has encoders on both axes. Not absolute encoders, but encoders nevertheless. So, my cable man is, bit, is a bit of a mess, so I apologize if it looks messy, but it works and it doesn't snag any of the cables. 
Plus the power mount isn't like other mounts. If it snags a cable, it lets you know it does not rip it apart like the Mead or the other mounts that I think iOptron as well would rip any cables apart. And that's how a lot of the cameras get their back connectors ripped. Um, I have a dew shield. I think I've showed this before. I have lights, very powerful lights coming from this house here, from the house behind me, uh, south, basically on the left of the scope and behind here. And I try to minimize as much as I can the light pollution that comes through this. And um, that's why the dew shield is there. It also protects the optics from humidity. So it's very good in my area because it can get pretty humid. Um, I think I haven't touched collimation in months. And it works really, really well. It has these huge mechanical um, screws that, uh, that require a special tool. And they're very, very good. Um, and I, I, I have to say, I'm really, really impressed with the mechanics that Officina Stellari put in this. Um, so let's get to the images. So we have, and I'm going to go here. This is a, the HA left and HA right. As you can see, the detail is really good. Uh, the nebulosity is good. I was still fighting these ugly looking diffractionings that came from the uh, secondary baffle. But nevertheless, let's see what we have. Excuse me. The reason I wanted to capture the left slide is because in the left side, you can see this, these dust formations to the right. And if I can see, here we go. These ones. And I think it's really important to capture this as a full image. So this is the mosaic of the HA. Now, you can mosaic many different ways and stack them together. The way I did it is, and the most successful way I, I found, was that I took the HA frames left and right. I did a... Um, blood exterminated on them, so the deconvolution and everything was applied. After that, I did a soft stretch. I took left and right images, took them in Photoshop, and then Photoshop has a much better way of doing that. But if you do it like that, it might be that Photoshop doesn't calculate properly between the channels and you'll get, you'll end up with weird stars in places that shouldn't exist. So the best way to do this is not to merge the images yet. So the best way I found was, let me go to the next workspace is, oh, this is the data merge, sorry. So you have the S2 data, which looks really good. The O3 data that looks, it looks good. I think the, the, the dark nebulosity is always what I'm looking for in oxygen. And I look at the inversion of the HA data with sulfur data. So I can see where the blue is at. So you can see there's a plenty of blue around the Milot 15, as everybody knows. And again, weird artifacts in here. Um, so usually that's what I do. So I stretch the files and then I, I stack them in Photoshop. But the best way I found is you do blood extermination on every single one if you want to. It doesn't, it doesn't do any bad. Uh, but in this situation, and let me find my mouse, what I did is I actually stacked the left and the right side data, and then I did blood extermination on that instead of the raw HA uh, sulfur and oxygen. And then I ended up with this. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Now, as you can see, there's some weird... Um, framing issues maybe from this guy's deep sky stacker and also because uh, the field of view might have moved maybe the oxygen uh, channel wasn't the best when it comes to the flat field but nevertheless um, this is what I had so what I did is I stretched these files uh, I did SCNR, removed all the green on both, removed the magenta stars of course by inverting and applying SCNR on green again and I did a dynamic crop just like I would do now here and I got rid of the part that looked really weird. So you can do that in Photoshop as well. I did it here. So now there's no more weird borders, right? So with these two stretched, uh, save the stiff at 16 bits. That's the easiest way to, to work in Photoshop. And 16 bits is enough. I saved them. I brought them in Photoshop. I did auto align. And then when they did align, this part, uh, basically this top part here had to be cut which is fine. I had to arrange them a little bit. After you framed it perfectly, so there's no empty space, you do uh, auto blend and you use a panorama setting and that's it. Then let's take a look at the files. The final workspace will show this. So like usual, when I bring it back, I remove the stars by working on the nebulosity. In this case, um, I removed the stars. I worked on the nebulosity. I increased, I did an S curve. I did some saturation. I use the mask to do high dynamic um, 
uh, range multi-transfer to bring back some of the detail around them a lot. Now, because I had those weird effects, you can still see the remnants of stars. I tried to clean it up as much as I could, but then um, I did something else. I looked around at this dark nebulosity. I wanted to emphasize it a little bit. So I used a couple of masks and then used a couple of S-curves and some desaturation to bring them out a bit more. Then I brought it into Photoshop. I did my color mixing. So as you can see, it's pretty reddish to orange. It's not the golden uh, uh, style, which is, again, something I really want to do. After that, I brought the stars back in. And um, this is what it looks like. So there's a couple of things why I like this image. It has this... This is the frame I, I really, really like from the Malat 15 and Heart Nebula. The little shape that Malat 15 has with these dust pillars. I think it's beautiful. I think um, I will shoot it with a bigger scope. I'm actually shooting it with a 14 inch ACF, which is much longer focal length, a little, big, a little bit bigger aperture. So when California stops <laughs> having rain most of the days, I will <laughs> I'll try to capture more data there. But this is the, the kind of framing I really like. I helped the front process 16 inch data and that was really impressive. I might actually do a video on that, but this is what I wanted to see. The oxygen is very, very subtle. Um, if you look at the heart nebula, there's oxygen within the heart nebula, but it's not a lot. Uh, it's pretty hard to pull out. You need quite a lot of hours. In my case, like I said, about 70 hours on both panels. I think this one has about 40 and this one has 30. Um, that would mean almost 10 hours per channel on this and 13 hours per channel on this. So in total about 23 hours of uh, hydrogen, 23 of oxygen and 20 something of sulfur. Um, my exposures were 900 seconds uh, each. So, you know, 15 minutes, it was pretty good. The stars are overly saturated. And the reason I did the Starless, and I'll go back to that because there's this little nebula here. I actually didn't know what it was called. I didn't discover it. It's called Weibo 1, this little oxygen planetary nebula. And the first time I imaged this object with this telescope, I actually discovered it. It was there, and then I, I somebody, I think on social media, told me what it's called. It's a very beautiful little nebula. And so I want to image this with both the bigger telescope and the RC. After I cleaned up my baffling issues, the stars will not have those weird artifacts around them, so they'll be a lot smaller, and I won't have any kind of weird artifacts around them. But given what I had at the time, the skies and the time I spent, I think it was around almost 20 nights that I invested in this project due to conditions in the sky and how long I could image it for and when it went into a zone where it's too light polluted or tracking and guiding wouldn't work because of the light pollution in the scene. I think it, it turned up as a great image. I really like it. It's it's a beautiful mosaic. I can't wait to print this uh, and mount it on acrylic sheets and on a large acrylic sheet and put it somewhere in my office. I don't have the space right now, but uh, in the future, I might decide to do it. So I also sell these as prints. Um, I would sell them along with my wife. She's a landscape photographer who does incredible work. And she'll be on the channel later on explaining some of her Milky Way shots. Uh, specifically, she did a mosaic of the Rofuki Nebula and uh, quite, a, quite a lot of other Milky Way projects. But we print these at home. She makes, she face mounts to acrylic. And then we show in different galleries around the Bay Area uh, and sometimes outside of the Bay Area. But um, it's a beautiful image. I wanted to kind of share it with everybody. If you have comments, suggestions, feedback, um, I'm around. Leave a comment in the uh, video and uh, thank you. I will see you in the next video. I might do something with the California Nebula soon, but we'll see. Thank you and goodbye.